Okay, today's topic is accrual accounting concept. This is possibly the toughest chapter in the financial accounting, and it, it's just it's difficult material. I'm going to do my best to give you a, a uh, understandable explanation of the process here. But anyway, what we're doing is we're applying the two basic rules of accrual accounting. Accrual accounting is required by generally accepted accounting principles. All publicly traded companies, which are all the big companies we know, have to use accrual accounting. And mo many private companies also have to use accrual accounting. If they apply for a loan at a bank, the bank's going to want to see financial statements used that have been prepared using accrual accounting. Small companies can still get away with the cash basis of accounting. And I'm going to talk briefly about the cash basis only for the purpose of comparing it to accrual accounting. But we really have to focus on accrual accounting concepts. So you don't need to worry about the cash basis other than to simply compare the difference between cash basis and accrual basis. Okay, so we're going to introduce the concept of revenue recognition, which is how, when do we record revenue? We're going to look at expense recognition, which we call the matching principle, also called the matching concept. Okay, so if you hear me say concept or principle, related to matching, same thing. And then we're going to spend a lot of time looking at adjusting journal entries, which I may abbreviate AJE, adjusting journal entries, uh, which are required in accrual accounting before we prepare financial statements. Remember, we always prepare financial statements at the end of the period. And I say period because it could be the end of the month if we prepare monthly financial statements. It could be the end of the quarter if we prepare quarterly financial statements, which public co publicly held companies are required to release to the public every quarter. And of course, every company prepares year-end financial statements. So the period could be month, quarter, or year. But at the end of that period, we prepare financials. And before we do, we have to prepare adjusting journal entries to make sure all related accounts that need adjustment are up to date and that we're presenting accurate information. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, let's just talk about revenue recognition. The word recognition in accounting simply means when do we record a journal entry and credit the revenue account? Okay? Expense recognition, which we call the matching principle, says we should record an expense in the same time period that it helps to generate revenue. And the matching principle, in order for us to follow this rule, we have to make certain assumptions. And I'm going to give you some examples of these. But sometimes it's very easy to identify when we should re record an expense. Other times it's not quite as easy. Okay, and this is what makes this area difficult. Okay, and then because of these two basic rules, revenue recognition and the matching principle, they generate all sorts of adjusting journal entries, which uh, most people have a very difficult time with. So I'm kind of laying that out there because you're going to have to read this stuff over a few times and practice it in order to survive the experience. Again, probably the toughest chapter in the whole class. Okay. Now, under the cash basis of accounting, <clears throat> which, by the way, is how most people would tend to think who've never had an accounting class, cash basis basically says, I'm going to record revenue. I'm going to recognize revenue when I get money, when I receive the cash. Okay? Not an unreasonable assumption. I'm going to record the expense when I pay the bill. Again, seems perfectly logical. Okay? But notice, the cash basis of accounting is not in accordance with GAAP, which is why we have to use the accrual basis of accounting. And I'm going to explain why just momentarily. Under the cash basis of accounting, we record revenue when we've earned it. Okay, notice what the first bullet point says. Transactions recorded in the periods in which the event occurs. Okay, which means something, some activity may have happened, but we have not yet paid for it or received the money for it. That's fine. It's the event or the activity that drives recording revenues and expenses in accrual-based accounting. Revenues are recognized or recorded with a journal entry when they're earned rather than when the cash is received. And again, I'm going to give you specific examples of this. Expenses are recognized when incurred 
rather than when paid. And again, we try to match the expense to the same time period that it helped to generate revenue. All expenses that we incur, and we said expense is a cost we incur to run our business, we wouldn't be incurring any expenses if we weren't trying to generate revenue. So we match the expense to the revenue under accrual basis accounting. I'm gonna compare the two bases of accounting, cash basis versus accrual basis. All right, let's just take a look at this slide just to rein reinforce the concept. We record revenue in the period in which it's earned. In a service-based business, doctor, lawyer, accountant, anything where you're providing a service, revenue is considered to be earned at the time the service is performed, okay? If I'm the New York Giants, the Los Angeles Lakers, whoever, whatever sports team I am, how do I provide that service? I entertain the crowd by playing a game. I win, I lose, whatever. I've provided the service. Airlines, how do they provide the service? They get you from point A to point B. How does a hotel provide service? Well, you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, and they've earned their revenue. Okay, now in a retail business or a merchandise-based business, the Walmarts and Home Depots of the world, the sale typically is recorded when you pay for the inventory. You buy a product, you pay for it, you walk out of the store, they recognize revenue. Okay. In the early goings of this class, we focus on service-based businesses because it's simply easier to account for. And then after we've introduced basic accounting concepts, we then introduce inventory and the issues related with inventory. Okay, so notice the little graphic there says, we recognize revenue when we have provided, and provided, ending with the letters ED, says past tense, done, right, finished, we've provided the service, we now recognize revenue. Matching principle. Match the expense to the same time period as the revenue, okay? And sometimes we're gonna see, with both revenues and expenses, the money gets either received for revenue or paid before we do the recognition, and sometimes the money gets paid or received after the recognition. And this is where the adjusting journal entries come in. Okay, why do we have these adjusting journal entries? Adjusting entries make it possible to report the correct balances on both the balance sheet and the income statement. If we don't do adjusting entries, as we're gonna see, both balance sheet and income statement are gonna be wrong, wrong balances, and people are making decisions to invest in your business, to loan you money, to extend credit, to do business with you, okay, based on your financial statement. If they're reading wrong information, this is a potential problem. So we need to do adjusting journal entries to make sure that both balance sheet and income statement have the correct amounts, okay? As previously stated, a company must make adjusting entries every time it prepares financial statements. And we always prepare financial statements at the end of a time period, okay, because we have to have seen how much activity took place, how much revenue did we generate, how much expense was incurred. That takes place at the end of the time period. Notice, this is a very important rule, and hopefully it'll guide you um, and prevent you from making mistakes. Every adjusting journal entry has to have one account from the income statement and one account from the balance sheet. Now, it could be a debit or a credit, just depends on the adjusting journal entry, but there's always one balance sheet and one income statement account in every adjusting journal entry. And cash, the cash account is never part of an adjusting journal entry. If you debit or credit cash, by definition, it's not an adjusting entry, okay? And so we're gonna see how this works. Okay, revenues are recorded in the time period in which the event took place. Expenses are matched to the expenses and we prepare adjusting entries to make sure we're following the two basic rules of accrual accounting. The two basic rules being revenue recognition and the matching concept or matching principle, okay? And these adjusting entries are prepared to make sure that both revenues and expenses are recorded on the income statement in the proper time period, okay? This is a busy slide. Okay, let's take a look at this thing. We have two basic types of adjusting entries. We have what's called deferrals 
and we have accruals. Those are the two basic types of adjustments, deferrals and accruals. Now notice, under deferrals, we have both expenses and revenues, and under accruals, we have both expenses and revenues, okay? Let's take a look at the definitions here. A deferral, which is kind of a confusing word, is when we've either received money in advance before we provide a service to our customer, or when we've paid for something in advance that is gonna later become an expense. Notice that for deferrals, we call them prepaid expenses, and we call deferred revenue unearned revenue. So try to, you as a student have to put all this stuff together. Unearned revenue is a form of deferred revenue, and a prepaid expense is a deferred expense. And the reason we use the word deferred is simply because the revenue or expense is gonna be recorded in a future time period. The money in the, in, for a prepaid expense, we're paying it in this month, it's not gonna become an expense until next month or a following month, and we'll see an example. Unearned revenue, my customer paid me in advance, and I will provide the service in a future month. So we're deferring the recognition of revenue or expense until a future time period. And accrual is the opposite scenario where we're gonna provide the service in the case of accrued revenues, we're gonna provide the service first, and we're gonna record revenue, and then we're gonna get paid in a future time period. An accrued expense, I incur an expense in this time period, but I don't pay that expense until a future time period. So in the first example of deferrals, the money gets paid or received before the revenue or expense is recorded, and an accrual, the money gets paid or received after the recognition of revenue or expense, okay? And this, again, this gets very confusing, so you simply have to try to sort the information in small bits and pieces. And again, reading the chapter a few times, not just once, unfortunately, and perhaps watching this video a couple of times hopefully will reinforce the information. So let's just go ahead and let's just read these together. All right, a prepaid expense. Expenses paid in cash and are recorded as an asset. First, we record it as an asset before they are used up or consumed. They will become an expense in a future time period when we've used it up, such as supplies, office supplies, or when time has consumed the benefit. For example, we paid for rent in advance or insurance in advance. The passage of time, ex these rent and insurance expire, okay? Unearned revenue, cash is received. In other words, we were paid in advance. And we initially re record the receipt of cash. Think of the journal entry. We're gonna record, ca receive cash. That's gonna be a debit to cash. But instead of crediting revenue, I'm gonna credit a liability called unearned revenue. Okay, because we haven't done the work yet. Once I do the work, okay, once we do the work that our customers paid us in advance for, we will then recognize revenue and then we'll reduce that liability, and that's called an adjusting entry, and we're gonna see an example of that. Accruals, accrued revenue. Revenues have been earned, but not yet received in cash or recorded in our accounting records. So we've done the work, and now we have to say, okay, even though we're not gonna get paid till a future time period, we gotta record the revenue now. We did the work and now have to record the revenue and an account receivable we will get paid in a future time period. An accrued expense, we've incurred expenses, but we have not yet paid that bill, so we have to accrue it. We have to record the expense, even though we're gonna pay it in a future time period. We record the expense in this time period, okay, when we receive this month's utility bill, for example, but we will pay it in the next time period, okay? So we're gonna see examples of all of this. Okay, and this becomes especially important because a lot of businesses have credit extended to them or they extend credit to customers. Okay, and sometimes you have deferred payment plans. We've all seen commercials on TV where there's no payment for another 15 or 18 months, okay? But we still have to record the revenues and expenses in the period in which the sale took place. Okay, and this goes to the heart of what accrual accounting is trying to accomplish and that is 
to measure the actual dollars and cents value of all the activity taking place even when credit is involved and deferred payments are involved. Okay? Okay, journal entries comparing the different methods of accounting. We're going to compare the accrual basis to the cash basis. Now, I'm going to show you three separate scenarios. Let's read this together. There are three scenarios. For each scenario, my company, or we should say our company, since we always account for our business, we are hired in November, and we're going to perform the service for my customer in December. I will be paid a different month for e in a different month for each customer to illustrate the difference between the two methods of accounting, cash basis versus accrual basis. My fees for this service are $500. Let's just assume we're doing their tax returns or painting their house or you know, cutting their grass or something like that, and we, pay, we charge a monthly fee of $500 for this service. Okay? So we're just dealing with one month here. First scenario, which is an example of deferred revenue. Okay, now, hopefully you can see this on your computer, but the journal entry for the cash basis is in red, and the journal entry for the accrual basis is in black. Okay? <clears throat> so, remember what we said. We get hired in November, and we're going to do the work in December. But in example one, we're going to get paid in November. So we're getting the money in advance. This is an example of deferred revenue which we call unearned revenue. Same thing. Unearned revenue, deferred revenue. So, in November, we get paid. Under the cash basis, remember what we said, the cash basis says, oh, if I get paid in November, I'm going to record revenue in November. And that's what they did. They debited cash, and they credited service revenue. Again, cash basis. The accrual basis says, well, I'm getting paid in November. I have to record the receipt of cash. And since I have not yet done the work, I have to recognize a liability, an obligation to perform service in the future. And so we're going to credit a liability account called unearned revenue for 500 In the month of December, we do the work to the customer's satisfaction. And now we have to see what journal entries do I record in December when the work is actually performed. Well, cash basis, there's no journal entry. Because I received the cash in November, I recognize revenue in November. Accrual basis, I now can recognize revenue because I've done the work. So I'm going to reduce the liability by 500 because I, don't, I no longer have an obligation. I fulfilled the obligation. And I'm going to recognize revenue. Here's the recognition part, revenue recognition. I'm going to credit service revenue. So notice, in November, we credited the liability. In December, we debit the liability, and that gets rid of the liability. The 500 debit and credit in unearned revenue offsets. We now have a zero balance, and I now have a credit balance in service revenue because I've provided the work. Okay? And there's your revenue recognition. This is an example of deferred revenue under accrual accounting. Second scenario. Remember, all three scenarios, we got hired in November, maybe a phone call, and we do the work in December. Now, in this example, they're paying me in December. And so when I do the work in December and I get paid in December, notice cash basis and accrual basis are identical. No journal entry in November because I didn't receive any cash, so cash basis is nothing to record, and I didn't do any work in November and so there's no journal entry under either scenario. If I don't show up to my customer's house to do the work, they're not out any money. They'll be annoyed because they were expecting me to do service and I didn't, but they're not out any money. Okay, so no journal entry in November under either case. In December, I do the work. I finish the job. I knock on the door. He hands me 500 cash. So cash basis, since I got paid in December, I'm going to record the receipt of cash and revenue in December. Accrual basis, since I provided the service, I have to recognize revenue in that month. And since I'm getting paid cash, I'm going to debit cash, credit service revenue. Same journal entry, both methods, because we got paid in the same month.
that we provided the service. When that happens, the two produce identical results. It's when money gets paid either before the service is provided or after the service is provided, that's when the two methods produce different results. Previously, we got paid in advance. Okay, and so I had to recognize a liability under accrual accounting. Okay, and in the next example, I'm going to provide the service in December, but I'm not going to get paid till January. Let's take a look at that one. Here I'm getting paid in January. They hired me in November. I actually provide the work in December, but they're going to pay me in January. Notice, cash basis. November, no journal entry. December, I do the work, but since I'm not getting paid, no journal entry. I get paid in January, so I debit cash, and I credit service revenue in January. Accrual basis. No journal entry in November. Nothing happened other than the phone call. In December, I do the work, and so I have to recognize revenue in December. But since I'm not getting paid, I'm going to record an account receivable. Debit accounts receivable, credit service revenue. There's my accrual. And in January, when they actually pay me the cash, I'm simply going to debit cash, and I'm going to reduce the account receivable since I've collected what was owed me, and so I eliminate the account receivable. The debit and credit for 500 offset each other, and there's a zero balance. Okay? So you should compare the three different scenarios to see the difference between a deferral and an accrual. A deferral, we receive money in advance, did the service in a following time period. In accrual, we did the work in this time period, got paid in the following time period. But notice, I'm going to go back to the previous slides. First example, I want you to notice under the accrual basis, revenue is being recognized in December in all three cases. Even though I'm getting paid beforehand, okay, I'm still recognizing revenue in December. Second example, I'm recognizing revenue in December, got paid in December. And third example, I'm recognizing revenue in December even though I'm getting paid in the following time period. Okay? And this is what accrual accounting is all about, is recognizing revenues and expenses in the time period in which the event took place, whether or not money was received beforehand or afterwards, or paid beforehand in the case of an expense or afterwards. Okay? And this is stuff that simply takes practice. Very few people are very good at accrual accounting you know, without some practice. Okay. Now, let's just talk about which accounts are involved in various adjustments. And we're not going to cover all of them. There are many accounts. We're going to cover about five or six different accounts to illustrate the concept. A deferral is for prepaid expenses and unearned revenue. Prepaid expense, deferred expense, same thing. Unearned revenue, deferred revenue, same thing. Unearned revenue and prepaid expenses are the terms more commonly used, but you simply have to recognize that they are both examples of a deferral. Prepaid expenses include supplies, prepaid insurance, prepaid rent, and equipment, or more broadly, property, plant, and equipment. There is a related expense and account and an asset account for each of these adjustments, and we'll see these. Okay? Now, for unearned revenue, the only one we're going to see is when we do work, and we just saw it a moment ago. Okay, now accruals. There's no other fancy words for accruals. We're simply accrued expenses and accrued revenue. Accrued expenses include wages or salaries, utilities, and interest. And there are others, but these are the only examples we're going to really take a look at. In fact, I don't think we're even taking a look at interest. Uh, for these accounts, we will have both an expense and a liability account. For accrued revenue, we have a revenue and an asset account. For this adjusting journal entry, we'll use service revenue and we'll have accounts receivable. Okay? Okay, now related to the deferral or deferred expense with equipment, we need to provide some additional information to talk about the concept of depreciation. Okay? So, 
When we have a piece of equipment or a vehicle or furniture or computer, whatever, we need to know three pieces of information. We need to know the cost, which is easily determined. Then we have to estimate what we call salvage value or residual value, and that is at the end of this asset's expected useful life, the third item, which again is an estimate, what do we think we're going to be able to recover? Okay, just like when you have a car. Maybe you hang on to a car for five years. At the end of the five years, it has maybe 100,000 miles on it, and you hopefully you're going to sell it for seven, eight, nine thousand dollars Depends on the car, obviously. That would be salvage value. Five years would be your estimated useful life, and that's just simply based on previous experience. We tend to hang on to vehicles for about five years. If you turn cars over every three years, then use three years. If you hang on for 10 years, use 10 years. There's no one correct number. It simply depends on what you expect to happen in both the salvage value, what you think you can recover, and maybe you use Kelly Blue Book, or the useful life. Now, we also need to have a few definitions here, which you're going to have to commit to memory. The first thing is what's called depreciable cost. And that's simply cost minus salvage value. Now, I'm going to do a quick example on the, on the board here. Let's assume we buy a vehicle, and the cost is, we'll say, $30,000. And the salvage value, we're going to estimate at we'll say $10,000. And the useful life, we're going to estimate at five years. To calculate depreciation, what we're going to call straight line depreciation, we need a formula. And that formula is this, cost minus salvage value divided by the useful life. So if we plug in the numbers, cost is 30,000 minus salvage value of 10,000 divided by five uh, years. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to put it underneath. That equals 20,000, which is my depreciable cost, divided by five is $4,000 per year. So the depreciable cost is simply the portion of the cost, the portion of 30000 that I'm not going to recover. Okay? I think I'm going to recover $10,000, so my true cost is 30 minus 10, 20000 That's the amount we're going to depreciate. Okay? And if I use a timeline, I have a five-year useful life. Each year, I'm going to depreciate $4,000. Okay, 4K, $4,000 depreciation expense each year. Now, if I want to know what my monthly depreciation is, I would simply divide 4,000 by 12. If I want to know what quarterly depreciation is, I can either divide by 12 and then multiply by three months, or I can simply divide annual by four. Okay, now. The next thing we need to know is the concept of book value and a new term, accumulated depreciation. The adjusting journal entry to record depreciation expense is debit depreciation expense, I'm going to abbreviate, in this case, it's an annual journal entry. It could be monthly. And I'm going to credit this new account, and again, I have to abbreviate, called accumulated depreciation for $4,000. Let's have a look. OK. <clears throat> and I need to erase the boards. I need some board space here. I'm going to get rid of my timeline up here. OK. So I have my equipment account, and I record the cost, 30000 and I have a related account called accumulated depreciation, and this is a contra asset. Now, we haven't heard this term before. 
The word contra means opposite or opposing. Okay, and so the only time we ever see accumulated depreciation is with an equipment-related account. Building, vehicles, computers, furniture. By the way, we never depreciate land. We'll talk about that when we talk about property, plant, and equipment in a future lecture. Okay, and we always record the accumulated depreciation each time period. It accumulates, it stays on the balance sheet, okay? And it's gonna show us what the un depreciated part of our original cost is. Okay, so we call this thing, or this account, a contra asset because an asset has a normal debit balance. A contra asset, opposite, is gonna have a credit balance. Now, here's my adjusting journal entry. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. I don't have the T account for depreciation expense on the board. If you want to write it down, that's fine. But at the end of year one, I'm going to credit the accumulated depreciation expense. That's posting it to the T account. I would post this 4,000 debit to the depreciation expense account. But remember, and I'm going to abbreviate here, depreciation expense is an expense that goes on the income statement. Accumulated depreciation is a contra asset that goes on the balance sheet. If we think back to a previous slide, I said every adjusting journal entry has one account from the income statement, one account from the balance sheet. And here it is, income statement, depreciation expense, okay? And balance sheet account, accumulated depreciation, a contra asset, so it goes on the balance sheet. Now remember, and we'll see this coming up soon. I've mentioned this before, Revenues, expenses, and dividends, which are part of retained earnings, are temporary accounts, which means they're going to get closed out at the end of the period after we've prepared our financial statements. A balance sheet account, such as accumulated depreciation, does not get closed out. It's a permanent account. So year after year after year, it accumulates. It keeps getting bigger. Look at the definition for book value. Book value equals cost minus accumulated depreciation. So at the end of year one, the uh, value that I put on my balance sheet, which is required by GAAP, is 30 minus four, or $26,000, okay? Depreciation expense goes on the income statement. Revenues and expenses will get closed out, so they get zeroed out. And each year, I continue to re record this journal entry. At the end of year two, I will have accumulated $8,000. So my book value on the balance sheet at the end of year two would be 30 minus eight or 22,000. Okay? And at the end of year three, I would credit accumulated for another 4,000. Remember, each year, I took my timeline off the board, but each year we put 4,000 expense on the income statement. And on the balance sheet, this continues to accumulate. And I need to erase this because I want to show you what happens. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this. End of year three, my book value would be 30 minus 12 or 18,000. End of year four, I've accumulated another 4,000. End of year four, my book value is 30 minus 16 or 14,000. And the end of year five, which is the end of my estimated useful life, accumulated has 20,000. My book value on the balance sheet is now $10,000. When your book value is the same as your salvage value, we are not allowed to record any more depreciation. Stop depreciating. You can continue to drive that vehicle. You estimated five years, but if your business is going through tough times and you need to hang on to the car for two or three more years, that's fine. It's your car. You're allowed to do that. This was your best estimate when you bought the car. Okay, so again, at the end of the fifth year, book value equals salvage value, we stop depreciating. We have what's called a fully depreciated asset. But for this lecture, the focus here is on the adjusting journal entry. Each year, I debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation for 4,000. 
The expense goes on the income statement. Accumulated depreciation, which is a contra asset, goes on the balance sheet. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at this big paragraph down here. We only depreciate those assets that we will use for more than one year, such as equipment, buildings, vehicles, furniture, computers, etc. Collectively, we call this property, plant, and equipment, or fixed assets. And again, we'll see this in a future lecture. Depreciation is simply spreading out the cost over the useful life of the asset rather than recording the entire cost as an expense in one year. Okay? And think of that timeline I had on the board. We just spread it out over five years. That's what depreciation is. Depreciation is not trying to determine market value at any point in time. It's an independent concept. When we sell this asset in five, six, seven years from now, we'll deal with market value at that point in time. This is not trying to determine market value, okay? We're simply following the rules of the matching principle. Depreciation is a good example of if I'm going to get five years use out of this vehicle, it's helping me to run my business for five years. We say that it's helping to generate revenue for five years, so I have to spread out the expense to match the expense with the time period that it helps to generate revenue. It's a good example of the matching principle in effect. Now, why do we have this accumulated depreciation account? I have two examples here to illustrate the importance. Look at the top example where a company simply shows us book value. Book value, which was cost minus accumulated depreciation, right, is the undepreciated portion of the cost 100000 for each company. So they have equipment worth $100,000. It doesn't give us that much information. I don't know what it originally cost. I don't know if it's an old machine, a new machine. Look at example two. Same companies with the additional information of cost and accumulated. Now this is providing more complete information, better information than the first scenario. Notice the book value, 100000 for each company, or for each piece of equipment, I should say, but we know that the first company's equipment cost a million originally, and that's an old piece of equipment because, look, we've written off 90% of it. 900,000 has been depreciated. That tells me this is an older piece of equipment. Second piece of equipment for company B is brand new. Cost 100,000, so it's not nearly as expensive as the first piece, but it's also a brand new piece of equipment. So the second scenario on the bottom of the slide gives us a more complete picture which is why GAAP requires us to show any equipment in property, plant, equipment at cost and to have a separate account for accumulated depreciation rather than simply credit the equipment account. This is a common mistake students make, is rather than crediting accumulated depreciation, they credit the equipment account. GAAP says don't do that. Show the original cost and show much how, dep how much depreciation has taken place in a separate account and this way we can see what the original cost was, how old the asset is based on the, the amount of depreciation, and what its current book value is. This is a better picture, a more complete picture, than the top half of the slide where we only show book value. Okay, onward. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this example. I'm going to need to erase the board here because we need a lot of board space. And we got a company. <clears throat> Joe Citrus started his own business, JC Inc., on March 1st, 2009. The trial balance at March 31st is as follows. Okay? Remember we said you list assets first with debit balances, then liabilities with credit balances, then stockholders' equity accounts with credit balances. If you have dividends, that would go there, but it has a debit balance. Then revenue accounts, credit balance. Then expense accounts, debit balance. And remember, on a trial balance, debits must equal credit. And thankfully, they do in this example. Okay? Now, I'm going to be kind of going back and forth a little bit. And if you have this slide in front of you, you may want to consider printing this slide because I'm not always going to have it up here. Okay? But let's take a look at this information, and now we need additional information. Other data so that we can prepare the adjusting journal entries at the end of the period, whether it's the month, quarter, or year. Supplies on hand, 
March 31st, total 980. We received a utility bill for 260 that has not been recorded and will not be paid until uh, next month. The insurance policy is for a year, and since we're preparing a monthly financial statement, we have to do monthly adjusting journal entries. 3940 of unearned service revenue has been earned at the end of this month. We paid salaries of 1500 well, Actually, we didn't pay them. We were going to accrue them at, at the end of the month. We'll pay them sometime in early April. Uh, the office equipment has a five-year life with no salvage value and is being depreciated at 250 per month for 60 months, which is simply five months, five years times 12 months a year. Invoices representing 3890 of services performed during the month have not been recorded. We did the work. Now we have to accrue the revenue. So what I'm going to do is this. And uh, work, work along with me here. Break out a piece of paper. Let's go back to the previous slide. All right? And what I want to do is this. I want to put the T accounts on the board. And we're going to adjust these accounts. Here's supplies. Has a beginning balance of 2080. I'm also going to put in a supplies expense account up here. This is part of our adjusting entry. There's no balance at the moment. OK, we have prepaid insurance. That has a beginning balance of 4,800. And right up here, I'm just going to put 400 per month. How do I get that? I simply divided 4,800 by 12 months. And we're going to adjust prepaid insurance, which is an asset, 400 bucks per month. Because as time expires, so too does the insurance. Okay, I'm going to need an insurance expense account up here for the adjusting entry. Then we have unearned revenue. This is a liability. Okay, and the previous slide, or actually this slide right here. Unearned revenue has a balance of 5200 So a customer, or a few customers perhaps, paid us in advance. We received 5200 so we debited cash, and then we credited unearned revenue. When we do the work, we will then reduce the liability, and then, after the service has been performed, we can then recognize revenue. Okay, then I'll put over here my equipment account which has a balance of 15000 I believe. There we go. And remember, I'm not going to adjust this account specifically, but as I record depreciation, I will have depreciation expense, and I will have accumulated depreciation. OK. So now that we have these T accounts here, we go to the additional data, all my T accounts that I need for adjustment purposes. Remember, cash is never involved in an adjusting journal entry. Okay? And certain accounts, I apologize, I need to put a few more T accounts up here. Okay? These are for the accruals. We're going to have utility expense and utilities payable. We're going to have wage expense and wage payable. And last but not least, I need to put accounts receivable up here. OK? Now, let's take a look at all the adjusting entries in order of the slide. OK, it says supplies on hand at March 31st total $980. OK, we began the month with 2,080. And what we're saying is we counted supplies in the cabinet, and we only have 980 left. We started with 2,080. Well, what do we do with supplies? We use them. We consume them in the normal course of business. Now, I can't write the journal entry. I'm going to describe it. And you need to think about this. In a previous lecture, we talked about how do you record a journal entry. If I used up supplies, then 
that's when the asset turns into or converts into an expense because I don't get my money back. I simply have to go out and I have to buy more supplies. That's, it's just the way it is. When we first bought the supplies, we recorded an asset because we were going to get benefit. It was a resource. As we use it up, it becomes a cost that we have to incur to run our business. It converts into an expense. So my adjusting journal entry is this. Debit supplies expense and credit the supplies account. Okay? Debit supplies, excuse me, debit supplies expense, credit supplies. Okay? This goes on the income statement. And the credit to supplies, which is an asset, reduces it from 2080 down to the balance of 980, which is what we have on hand. Okay? You can't just write in 980. In the world of accounting, you got to debit and credit your way to whatever balance you need to be in. Okay. Then it says a utility bill for 260 has not been recorded and will not be paid until next month. So we've been burning through electricity, air conditioning, heating, whatever it may be, lighting for the whole month. We get the bill, it's 260 bucks. Since we used the electricity that month, we have to record utility expense that month, even though we're not going to pay the bill until the following month. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to accrue the expense and the related liability. My adjusting journal entry is to debit utilities expense, which goes on the income statement, and I'm going to credit utilities payable. Okay, this is an accrued expense. I incurred the expense. I have to record it in this time period, and I'll pay it in the following time period. Now remember, an adjusting journal entry does not include the cash account. So in the following month, what are we in? I think we're in March. Okay. In April, when I paid the bill, that's not an adjusting entry. This is the adjusting entry to accrue the expense, to recognize the expense in the proper time period. Supplies, which we said earlier was an example of a deferred expense because we initially bought the supplies, recorded as an asset, and then we deferred calling an expense or deferred recognizing the expense until we actually used it up in a following time period. Okay? So we've seen a deferred expense, supplies, and we've seen an accrued expense, utilities. Okay, now we're going to look at insurance. Notice the insurance policy is for one year, and since we're preparing monthly financial statements, I have to record one month's worth of insurance expense. Insurance, we said 4800 divided by 12 months is $400 per month. So each month, as I use up insurance with the passage of time, the asset's going to go down in value, and I don't get my money back. I wish I did. I'd, I'd have a lot of money since I, I'm a pretty good uh, person to be insured. I don't get into too many accidents. Okay, I'm in my adjusting journal entry is to debit insurance expense and to credit prepaid insurance. And so now I have 11 months of insurance left. Okay, so the adjusting journal entry, debit insurance expense, we always put the debits first, credit the asset prepaid insurance to reduce it. Okay, and here it is. I always debit expenses. Remember that? We always debit expenses and reduce the asset by one month's worth of insurance from 48 down to 4,400. This goes on the income statement, prepaid insurance, the adjusting entry on the balance sheet. So remember, all adjusting journal entries, one income statement account, one balance sheet account. Okay, doesn't, you don't know which one's going to be debited or credited until you know what type of an adjusting entry it is. Okay? Be careful, you're, you're, you're looking for little shortcuts. Okay, I always do this, I always do that. There are four different types of adjusting entries and there are four different sets of rules. We have deferred expenses, deferred revenues. We have accrued expenses, accrued revenues. And so be careful in terms of drawing a conclusion prematurely. 3940 of unearned service revenue has been earned at the end of the month. Okay, now notice, unearned revenue, 39 was, we originally had 5,200, and we're saying that we recognized 3940, so I'm going to reduce the liability by the portion that was owed, 
So I'm going to debit unearned revenue, and I'm going to credit service revenue. Once I've earned the revenue, I recognize the revenue. Here's the revenue recognition right here, and I have to reduce the liability from 5,200 down to 1,260. And what this 1,260 represents is money that we received in advance that we have not yet performed service for, and we will in the future. Okay, but we were paid 5,200 in advance, and now we've done 3940 of work this month. Therefore, reduce the liability, recognize revenue. Service revenue goes on the income statement. This is a liability. We're reducing the liability because we've done the work, and now we only owe them 1260. Salaries of 1500 are accrued at March 31st. Now this is very common. Most people get paid either every other week or once a month. Some people get paid once a week or so. And it's very common for a pay period to start towards the end of one month and end in the beginning of the following time month. In business, we have to allocate the number of days worked in each month to that time period. Now, in this example, whether we get paid, let's just say it's weekly, and <clears throat> a few of the days of this pay period were in March, and a few of them, say Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever, were in April, then the two or three days that were in March, which is the 1,500, have to be recorded as an expense in March. And then those other remaining days that were in April, they'll get recorded as an expense in the month of April. Okay, so to accrue the expense, we've incurred the expense because my employees have worked. It's now March 31st. They've worked for two or three days. I've got to put that expense in this month. So I'm going to debit wage expense, 1500 And since I'm not going to pay them for several more days, you usually pay your employees after they've worked, I'm going to credit wage payable, 1500 Now. Let's just say on April 8th or 9th, whenever payday is, when I pay them, I'll debit wage payable and I'll credit cash. Okay? When we look at the current liabilities chapter, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about payrolls. That's not really our focus right now. It's the focus is the concept of an accrued expense, which is what these two examples are. Utility expense and wage expense are accrued expenses because we incur the expense this month we're going to pay it the following time month, a uh, time period, excuse me. Okay, the office equipment has a five-year life with no salvage value and is being depreciated at 250 per month. So some types of equipment, due to obsolescence in technology, will have little to no salvage value. If we divide 15,000 by five, that's $3,000 depreciation per year. And since we're recording monthly depreciation, 3,000, which is annual depreciation, divided by 12 months, 250 monthly depreciation. And as we saw previously on the board, debit depreciation expense, which goes on the income statement, credit accumulated depreciation, which goes on the balance sheet, contra asset. Okay? So debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated. And just real quickly, if I were preparing a balance sheet at the end of March, in the non-current asset section, under equipment or property, plant, and equipment, my book value would be cost of 15 minus 250 of accumulated depreciation. Book value would be 14,750, and that's the value we put equipment on the balance sheet. Last, invoices representing 3,890 of services performed this month have not been recorded, so we have to accrue them. This is an example of accrued revenue. We did the work. Now we've got to send a bill to the customer. They're going to pay us next month. And we have to record the revenue this time period, even though we're not going to get paid till the following time period. This is an example of accrued revenue. So I'm going to debit accounts receivable, 3890. And I'm going to credit service revenue, 3890. Now remember, even though service revenue we saw it related to unearned revenue when we got paid in advance. And now, here we're doing the service and we're going to get paid after. I only need one service revenue account. Okay? So debit accounts receivable, credit service revenue. There's my journal entry. Debit AR, credit service revenue. Next month when I get paid, 
I will debit cash, and I'll credit accounts receivable to get rid of it since we've collected and they no longer owe us that money. So we always have to update receivables and payables once we've received the money or once we've paid it so that we don't think we have to pay it again and again or get keep billing the customer for the same amount. Okay, so we've just seen a whole variety of adjusting journal entries. All right, and now we're going to pause and we're going to look at the financial statement impacts that adjusting entries have on the actual financial statements. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at an example, one example of a deferred expense, deferred revenue, accrued expense, and accrued revenue, and we're going to look at the impact that it has on the financial statements. And what we're going to do is we're going to show, as we see on the board here, what the financial statements would look like with the adjusting entry and without the adjusting entry. Now, I've only put up the income statement here on the board, and I'm going to kind of walk you through the effect on the balance sheet. <clears throat> now, first, let's take a look at supplies. We used $1,100 of supplies this month, so we recorded the adjusting entry, debit supplies expense, credit supplies. Again, GAAP requires us to perform adjusting entries, so we follow the rules of accrual accounting. What if we didn't follow these rules because we didn't know what they were? We never had a class in accounting, and for some crazy reason, I ended up as the controller of a business. I've seen this happen. So. Notice on the, on the board here, on the far right, we say if we didn't record, if we did not record an adjusting entry, this is what we would think we have for revenues, expenses, and net income. This column says this is really what we have. And what we're doing is one at a time, we're going to isolate the effect of each adjusting entry if we did it versus did not do it, what the impact is on the financial statements. Starting with supplies. Now, if I did not adjust the supplies account, then I would think, I'm going to cover it up, that my supplies is actually 2,080, when in fact, my supplies is 980. If I did not record the adjusting entry, my assets would be too high. And the term we use is they would be overstated or overvalued. So my assets would be too high because I didn't adjust. And the expense, I would think, was zero when, in fact, the supplies expense should be 1,100. My expenses would be too low. Let's go to the income statement. Supplies expense is really 1,100. Therefore, my net income is really 28,900. If I did not record this adjusting entry, I'd think my total expenses were 40,000 and my net income was 30000 So on the balance sheet, my assets would be overvalued. I'm showing people that I have more than I really do. It's misleading. And on the income statement, I'm reporting 30000 when I should be reporting 28900 because my expenses are really 41100 Add the two together. And my net income is 28900 Okay, so the effect is assets would be overvalued. Expenses would be undervalued. If expenses are undervalued, my net income is going to be overreported. Again, this is the effect if we do not record the adjusting entry. We are required to record this adjusting entry. If we didn't, expense too low, net income too high, and as a result, net income we know goes into retained earnings, stockholders' equity would be too high. So on the kind of the accounting equations, assets would be too high and equity would be too high. Notice we're still in balance. That's not the issue. The issue is both the balance sheet and the income statement have an error on them. We're reporting inaccurate information, and if people make a decision based on inaccurate information and things go wrong, they can sue us because our financial statements were in violation of GAAP. This is a very big issue because we're, these are small numbers here. When you talk with Big businesses, you're talking about millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and adjusting entries can have a significant impact on the bottom line, on net income. Let's look at unearned revenue. Now, we were paid 5200 in advance, debit, cash, credit, unearned revenue. 
During this month, we did 3940 of service, and so I recognized 3940 of revenue. Okay? And I reduced the liability, so now I still owe them 1260 worth of service. If I did not adjust the unearned revenue account and recognize revenue, I would think the liability was still 5200 so my liabilities would be too high, and I would not have recorded 3940 in service revenue. My revenue would be too low. Let's take a look. I would think my total revenue was 70000 Expenses were not affected in this adjusting entry. Okay, we're isolating one adjusting entry at a time. I think net income was 30000 30, When in fact, my revenue is really 70 plus 39.40, right? So my, my net income is actually $33,940. I'm underreporting revenue and net income in this case, okay? And so notice that each adjusting entry is going to have a slightly different effect on both the balance sheet and the income statement. From an accounting equation standpoint, this is where things really get tricky. Again, if I did not record this adjusting entry, I'd think my liabilities were 5,200. My liabilities would be too high. My revenue, if I didn't record it, would be too low. If revenue is too low, net income is too low. And since this goes into retained earnings, which is stockholders' equity, my equity would be too low. So on the right side of the accounting equation, here's assets, here's liabilities plus stockholders' equity. I'm going to step over, which means here's liabilities, here's stockholders' equity. Liabilities, if I did not record the adjusting entry, would be too high. Equity would be too low. They would offset each other. The right side would still be in balance with the left side, but we would simply have a mistake again on the balance sheet and on the income statement. Okay? This is the effect adjusting entries have on our financial statements, because remember, we said every adjusting entry has one account on the income statement, one account on the balance sheet, okay? This is the rules of accounting. Cruel accounting, revenue recognition, the matching principle require us to prepare four different types of adjusting entries. Deferred revenue, deferred expense. Accrued revenue, accrued expense. Okay, third example. And again, we're isolating each individual case to show the effect. Here, this one was, supplies was a deferred expense. This was an example, unearned revenue is deferred revenue. Now we'll look at the accrual. Wage expense, we are accruing the expense. Now this is a little bit trickier because this number here, these two numbers, that is my adjusting entry. Notice there was no previous balance there. It was a zero balance, whereas with the deferrals, we adjusted a number. We adjusted supplies from 20,000 to uh, 2,800, 2,800, whatever, to 980, and we adjusted unearned revenue from 52 to 1,260. Here, there's nothing in either one of these accounts. The adjusting entry puts something in there to accrue, is to recognize we did something, something took place, we now have to account for it. We have to record it. So the adjusting entry, debit wage expense, credit wage payable. If I did not record this adjusting entry, I would think, wage payable was zero, when in fact it should be 1500 It would be liabilities would be undervalued. And wage expense, I would think, was zero when it should be 1500 Wage expense would be undervalued. Let's go to the income statement here. Wage expense is 1500 Therefore, net income is really 28500 if I did not record this adjusting entry, I'd think my total expenses were 40000 and net income was 30000 But the, the accurate, the true number, the correct number, expenses are 41500 net income 285 Okay, so here we go. Accounting equation, if I did not record the adjusting entry, I would think liabilities were, were zero. They would be too low. They should be 1500 Expenses, I would think, were zero. They should be 15. Expense is too low. If an expense is not recorded, expenses are too low, net income will be too high. And here it is. Okay, so this is my actual expenses. This is net income. Since net income 
was overstated, equity, retained earnings would be overstated. Again, it would equal out in terms of the accounting equation, but we'd have a mistake on the balance sheet and we'd have a mistake on the income statement. Last example. This is accrued revenue. I did work for a customer and they're going to pay me next month. But uh, since I did the work this month, I still have to accrue it. So my adjusting entry to accrue revenue is debit AR, accounts receivable, credit service revenue. Okay? Now, really you only have one service revenue account. I simply wanted to show them side by side. Okay? If I did not record this adjusting journal entry, I would think AR was zero when in fact it's 3890. Assets would be too low didn't record service revenue, revenue would be too low on the income statement. Service revenue, as a result of this adjusting journal entry, 3890, therefore, here's what revenue should be and net income should be. If I did not record this adjusting entry, I'd think revenue was 70. Expenses were not involved in this adjusting entry, so they're unaffected. Net income, I would think, was 30. But really, the accurate number is revenue is a total of 73,890 minus 40. Net income is 33,890. So, last, if I didn't adjust to accrue revenue, AR, assets would be too low. Revenue would be too low. Net income would be too low, and therefore, equity, retained earnings would be too low. Now, that is an awful lot to think about. This is a tricky area, and uh, you got to take my <laughs> advice on this one. You're going to have to read this a couple of times and practice it, uh, because it's considered to be a very important part of financial accounting. Where this is an area where financial statements can really be misstated. Uh, more importantly for you, I plan on testing you on this material, so please take a good hard look at this, practice it, and hopefully it'll make some sense. Okay, and that'll do it.